I'd like everybody to pull out their smartphone. Good. Does everybody have a smartphone? So I want to, we're going to start off with a little math right before lunch. There are about, at least in two, 2008, they said there were 417,000 lumbar fusions done in the United States that year. Now we know the incidence is going up. So since we have orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons, I'm going to take it to my orthopedic level, and we're going to round up to 500,000. So 500,000, each construct is going to have four screws at a minimum, right? So let's times that by four. And we know from some of the recent work by Cosmopolis, and I love that name because it's a town not too far away from here, that 10% of those screws are going to be misplaced. So let's take our numbers to 10%. Now most of those numbers, those 10%, are not going to influence the nerves. Most of the time, we look back on these x-rays or CAT scans, and we see that things are actually OK. Wow, that screw's not exactly where I want it, but the patient doesn't have a problem. Unfortunately, some of them do have a problem. And so let's take a very conservative number. Let's say 95% of the time, those screws that are misplaced don't hit the nerve, but 5% of them do. So let's multiply this by 0.5. Now, there's 52 weeks in a year seven days a week, and we end up with 27 screws causing a nerve problem in the United States every day. Right here today, 27 people have a foot drop. And in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to tell you what we can do to try to lower that number down. I want you to remember your first screw. This is where I live. I work at Capital Medical Center. I'm a partner in Olympia Orthopedics. And this is what I do. I do some basic spine work. I happen to have a robot. And I do some deformity and revision type work. These are my disclosures. Now getting back to your first screw, you're probably scared you were going to mess it up probably worried that you might hurt the other person. You were concerned your colleagues might ridicule you. And you may even be concerned you would disappoint your teachers. You had studied your anatomy. You practiced on your cadaver. You had maybe even had a C-arm or an unshielded CAT scan in the room with you. But somehow things looked different. Here you were. You're going to have to do it. So there is an intersecting line of the patient's best interest and your self-interest, and somehow you had to summit this line and get over it. Whether it was misplaced confidence, hubris, pride, whatever, you took that all in your hand, and you passed that lanky probe, and thus began your journey to being the expert spinal instrumentators that you all are today. Some of you know, and the rest of you will know in one sentence, that I used to be a professional musician, and before I got hit by the medicine bug, I played in the orchestra. And in the orchestra, we had an opportunity to play with amateurs that had won various competitions, and we'd back them up as they played their concertos. And we also had the opportunity to play with traveling professionals. And in that experience, I kind of discovered something that probably most of you know, that the difference between an amateur and a professional is not how you do on your best day. These amateurs could nail these pieces on their best days. But what made the pros pros was how they play on their worst day. And I think that's an important concept when we talk about robotics. Many of you have also heard and seen presentations where they use illustrations like this, describing how you can be accurate, you can be precise, but they're not necessarily the same thing, accuracy being on target, Precision being reproducibility. My adoption of robotic technology was based on the fact that I think it makes patients safer. It makes me a better surgeon. And I believe that within my professional lifetime, this will be the standard of care. Every hospital, every surgeon here has a hallway somewhere probably down by OR 10, 11, 13, where a dust-covered machine lays, where someone else told you the latest, greatest thing was going to save you and make everything perfect. 
So what is this? Why is it different? Why should you care? There is a poem. It goes around in the religious circles. So I'm going to make it secular because it's a CME talk. So we're going to say that two friends have recently deceased, and they're walking along the beach. And each footstep represents an important moment of their life. And during the good times, there's two sets of prints. But during the bad times, there's only one set of prints. And so the friend turns to his other friend and says, you were with me when my kids were born. You were with me during my first and second marriages. You were with me during all the good times, but here during my divorce. Or when my dog died, you left me alone. I'm walking alone. And the friend says, I didn't leave you alone. I was carrying you. This brings up the guided hand technique. The principle that many of the navigation systems that have preceded this will get you close, but they don't guide your hand. This is a copy of a planning stage that's done with the Renaissance software. You can plan out where your screws go, X, Y, and Z access. You can identify any potential pitfalls that anatomy may throw in your way, a large memory process. You can measure your length. You can measure your width. You can control the depth of the screw. And in this case, the drill, as you'll see, there's a little circle where the depth is done. And then you execute it. This is a picture in the operating room. My hand is obscuring the actual robot, but it has guided a cannula that I am then manually drilling through. This is a cutaway version. Now the anatomy has been reversed. The head is to your left and the feet to your right. But you can see how the cannula goes down into the position that you had previously planned out on your software, and it is guiding your hand. When I got my robot, the hospital administrators and the patients were all very hot about this topic because another robot, a dissimilar type of technology, had been recently advertised on TV with class action lawsuits. And everybody kept asking me, you're not using that robot that's hurting people. And so I had to distinguish that and do a little education. This is a robot that I use to help perform the surgery safer. I am touching you. I am doing the surgery. We talked earlier, in fact, some excellent references to the growing body of knowledge that radiation in the OR is a real deal. And I like the comment about all the pregnant ladies in the OR because that has entirely devastated my work staff uh, over the past two years. We've had uh, half a dozen pregnancies. And so radiation-induced malignancy is a real thing. I'd like to pull four cases and use each one to illustrate a point about how the robot has helped me and my patients. So we'll start off with Wayne. Wayne's a high schooler. He's a good kid, gets good grades, looking forward to a computer engineering degree at Carnegie Mellon on scholarship. I think, Kojo, that's in your town, isn't it? And uh, great kid. Dealt progressively worsening curve, and he didn't like the way it looked, had some minor back pain, and decided to undergo surgical treatment. And the case principle that I want to illustrate with this is that we were able to plan out every single screw that we used. We only sterilized the screws that we needed. And we were able to execute the surgery very rapidly with a great deal of precision. And this was our end result. I'm sure there'll be some comments about that later. These are all my cases. I take the full responsibility. Case two is Scott. Scott's kids dance with my kids in ballet. He's an administrator in one of the local school districts. And he had a herniated disc with retrolisthesis. And I thought I'd do him a favor after failure more conservative measures and do an ALIF and avoid dis disrupting the posterior muscles. And he did well for two years, actually 23 months. And on the 23rd month, he's doing crutches, crunches at our local gym. And here's a snap and a pop and his back pain returns. Now this time, unlike the first time, he didn't have any leg pain or symptoms. It's just mechanical back pain. And we get an x-ray, and it shows that the hardware is broken. And indeed, CAT scan confirmed that although we still had increase in foraminal height, we had a pseudarthrosis and fractured hardware. Well, how am I going to get out of this one? Hmm. Well, I got the robot. So I planned it out with the robot. I made sure that my screws could avoid the previous hardware. And I was able to execute the surgery through a minimally invasive technique. And the 
Scott allows me to show you that I could do a minimally invasive technique with a greater degree of confidence and a substantially less amount of fluoroscopy because I was able to use this technology. I saw him actually yesterday for his six month follow up. He's doing well and his symptoms have resolved. Mary, many of you, because you're beloved members of your community, have the patients that bring you cupcakes, that remember your birthday, that knit stuff for your kids. That's Mary. And I've known Mary since I moved here in 2008, and she had a dynamic spondylolisthesis, a broad based disc bulge at 5'1, and after fairly more conservative measures, I did a T lift. She did well. About a year or two, routine follow up seemed to be doing well, but a little bit after year two, she started noticing she couldn't walk as far, started having more back pain. And x rays revealed the dynamic spondylolisthesis developing above that. And of course, we tried shots, we tried exercises. I think she even wore a corset brace for a little period of time. But eventually, we decided to move on to surgery. And at that point, I had learned the lateral technique. And I said, well, I'll do her a favor. I'll do the lateral technique, because it's, it's going to avoid disrupting those posterior muscles, and it's going to be great, and we'll avoid adjacent segment disease. So I did that, and sure enough, she did OK. And we had about a year of honeymoon of doing great, but then in routine follow-up, we find that she's developing adjacent segment disease again. Now, by the time we get around to the third operation, this hole that I'm continuing to dig here, I had learned another technique. I had new expandable cages at my option, medial cortical screws, and I was like, oh, Mary, I got just the thing for you. And I did that, and it quickly went to crap. This time, I didn't get a honeymoon. This time, she went into proximal junctional kyphosis right away. I've got a problem. I got a big problem. And I love this lady. I'm not getting cupcakes anymore. How am I going to figure this out? Well, it doesn't help that Mary's a little Rubenesque. It doesn't help that she has significant heart disease. It doesn't help that her bones are the quality of wet tissue paper or that her biggest pedicle is maybe three and a half millimeters. But I had a robot. So I planned it out on the robot. And I planned out my Smith Peets. And I planned out my PSO, and I did her surgery. And it went fast. I didn't lose that much blood. And I got the correction. She's seven and a half months out. Her head's above her pelvis. She's walking around. I'm getting cupcakes again. I'm a, she's happy, and I'm happy. This is Carl. Carl's 65. He had previously had a posterior inner body fusion done at the L4, L5 level with these cages in the early 90s. He went on to develop adjacent segment above and below. And I think about 2009, I addressed that after fairly more conservative things with an L2 to S2. And he did well initially. As we continued to follow him along, began concerned about the super adjacent level. And those screws appeared to have moved. And in fact, as this adjacent segment disease and his what became later apparent was pseudoarthrosis at L2, L3 progressed, it became time to revise him. And you all are very, very experienced. Many of you way more experienced than me. So I imagine that you've confronted this issue before, where a pedicle that's been moving around, a pedicle screw, it develops a hard shell around it. And redirecting through that can be a real challenge. So Carl's going to demonstrate us the power of redirection. We were able to map this out, again, using all three X, Y, and Z access. Could plan the depth, the width, the angle. Start with a new starting point, completely fresh, and redirect that screw so that the screw is where I want it. I got my robot in September. I started using it in October of 15. I've done over 100 cases. And the first three things that I noticed is that I'm way more confident about where my screws are going. Not that as an orthopedic spine surgeon, confidence has ever really been a problem, but it does give me some reassurance. I know where I'm placing them, and I've, that preoperative plan can be executed. There's a lot less radiation. Very minimal fluoro is needed to do these types of procedures. And it's allowed me to do minimally invasive techniques with a degree of confidence that I've never had before. Patients are excited. Hey, Doc, did you use the robot? How did it do? We even had one of them name the robot. And the hospital's pleased with increased efficiencies in the OR and with the increased volume 
that has come from this. There are some challenges with adopting robotic technology. It's not cheap. There's a disposable case, there's an upfront cost, and there's an initial learning curve. I don't want to downplay that. But my experience has been very positive, and that's shared by the other 72 centers across the United States. Large amount of screws have been placed in a large number of cases. Accuracy is less than a mil one and a half millimeters. There's been no permanent neurologic deficit in these cases, and we've noticed a dramatic reduction in, in uh, fluoroscopy. So getting back to those 27 screws that have caused a neurologic problem every day in the United States, I think this technology can help us with that. And whether it's this particular one or with something similar, or there are a lot of these that are going to be emerging fairly soon, I think that we as a spinal community can do better than what we're doing now, and that this is one of the ways to do that. I'm going to be obviously at the lab, and I think in the interest of saving time for lunch, uh, please come up to me in the lab or afterwards or in the hallway, and, and I'll take your questions there. Thank you very much.